welcome back to Paragaming Productions, where my name is Jared, and this week I have an amazing guest on. Uh, he is uh, Lindsay's uh, significant other. Sir, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hi there, everyone out there. My name is Stratton Meyer. Um, as was mentioned, I am the proud partner of Lindsay Little, who uh, publishes Only Girl, the weekly webcomic on Webtoons. Uh, but I have my own life as well, so I hope we'll talk a bit about me. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, uh, I know I've already asked this, but please tell everyone where that luscious accent comes from. Sure. Uh, so my my life story is a bit of a long one, unfortunately, but the gist of it is uh, born in Australia, but sort of raised a bit of everywhere. My dad is English, so I sort of inherited a little bit of his mannerisms and way of speaking. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge. I live in uh, Houston, Texas now, so I'm sure I'll be saying y'all within a couple of years. <laughs> You know, I spent uh, five years down in Texas, and I can tell you that I ended up using y'all at like the last year I moved out, so no worries. <laughs> okay, so I've got a year left before it starts. <laughs> you got a year yet, yeah. Um, so, Stratton, you kind of had mentioned to me just a brief second ago that you you shied away from video gaming just because of the way the world works, especially with the pandemic. You said you only have a PlayStation 3, right? Uh, that is, I think, uh, I recently bought a Nintendo Switch, but other than that, the PlayStation 3 is the most recent gaming console uh, that I own. But I actually still have my old Nintendo 64, I've still got my old GameCube, um, and my old uh, Wii as well. So I've got a couple of generations of Nintendo under my belt, but PS3 is sort of the most recent until I started dipping my toe back into the... Uh, into the deep end with uh, the current generation. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, the the um, oh banana sandwich, I already forgot it. The Switch. There we go. The Nintendo Switch. Uh, I I think it, Lindsay was telling me about how she plays Animal Crossing on that. Right? Do you dabble in that as well too, or? Yeah, uh, that game was actually the reason why I ended up um, jumping in and purchasing the Switch. Uh, it was the first game that. I sort of felt like I had the mental energy to play because it doesn't require a huge amount of um, investment in terms of like sit down for four hours and play whatever it is, play the latest Far Cry or um, yeah. the latest Assassin's Creed. You've got a hundred <laughs> hours of content. It's going to take you this long. Uh, with Animal Crossing, I sort of felt comfortable just saying, okay, I'll play an hour every day, every couple of days. I won't care that I'm making progress at my own pace and I would be, just be happy to like let things go that way. So it was an easy way for me to justify the investment in a new system um, and not worry too much about keeping up with the latest and greatest and making sure I, I was a completionist about everything the way I had been in the past. So the, the very slow-paced nature that is Animal Crossing, where you basically can finish your day in about 45 minutes to a half hour, depending upon how quick you want to run through it, is uh, is more up your alley, I guess would be the correct terminology there? I, I think now definitely that's the case. Um, there are d things in my life that I'm able to sink more and more time into, but with the way that just my life has been for the last couple of years, uh, the nature of that that system where you don't feel pushed to 100% everything, you don't feel pushed to to give it 100% of your energy and, and your um, mental effort was just, uh, yeah, really appealing to me. So how far are you in Animal Crossing? Because I, I think I was talking to Lindsay and Lindsay and I were very impatient. Uh, in, in, in the builds, and I remember the first day that I had it, I think I got it like as soon as it came out, and then I was magically two weeks ahead of time by the end of the day, so I don't know, where are you at kind of with the game? Um, I was one of those people who shied away from time traveling, um, no shade to those who <laughs> go about it, but that's just not the way that I have ever played it. I um, I previously played Wild World, City Folk, and... Um, New Leaf as well, um, and with this latest one, New Horizons, um, I was sort of more willing to just engage with it at its own pace, but the way that that game is structured, I sort of found myself, by the beginning of October last year, I found myself wanting more out of the game than it was able to provide, like I had finished 
the museum and I'd got my island to where I wanted it and there weren't really any more furniture series for me to collect. And so it's sort of just uh, dropped off my radar and I haven't touched it in months. Ah, okay. So what are you, uh, what, what's, what's, what's caught your eye so far? Like, what are we, what are we currently playing? What are we currently playing here? Uh, yeah, so I am currently replaying Metroid Fusion. Uh, I mentioned I have a GameCube and I've got the Game Boy player attachment for the bottom Ooh. of that. Um, so I've been replaying some of the Metroid games in advance of Dread when it comes out this week. Uh, that is one of those series that really like got me into gaming in a more serious way. Uh, my first one was Metroid Prime for the GameCube, and I got it on a whim. I mean, I was a kid, but I got it on a whim when I wanted to buy one game, and the guy at GameStop said, hey, we've got a, a deal for buy two, get one free on used games, and I picked up Metroid Prime and Beautiful Joe, and Prime just sucked me <laughs> in forever, and I have been in love with that series. Um, so I've been replaying uh fusion and i just finished super metroid um using the switch online uh membership in advance of dread coming out and i've been really enjoying myself uh so i didn't know that metroid dread was a game i remember metroid when it was back on the old brick you know uh that's that's when i uh, i think i remember my dad actually had to beat the the final boss for me and I didn't understand the ending. I didn't get it. But, you know, again, that was probably because it was six or something like that. You have one day, 22 hours, and 46 minutes before release. It's got the countdown is on. Man, I I'm, it, I'm yeah. feeling every one of those minutes. <laughs> uh, I see occasionally on Reddit someone will say, oh, Amazon messed up and sent me the game early. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I am very jealous of those people. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, a big, a big old middle finger to those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, funny that you mentioned that because uh, Battlefield 2042, I pre-ordered it and it's supposed to start at like 2 a.m. today. And I was like, I got the podcast with Stratton. I'm going to go ahead and go to sleep right afterward. I'm going to get up at 2 or 3 in the morning and I'm going to hop on. I'm going to play for a couple of hours. Like I even tried to log like before this, I got off of work. I clicked on it. And I was like, let's see if I can log in early. Totally didn't let me. Totally didn't let me. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> The, uh, those automated systems are annoyingly good at knowing when not to let you on, aren't they? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's thrown you, it's, I think it's just a loop where it's trying to confirm that you had pre-ordered, but they're, they put a block on the confirmation to make sure because I pre-ordered one of the very few games I pre-ordered. So what they're going to do is, uh, I think they're checking the pre-order and they just block that on the whole system. So it just keeps throwing you in a constant loop, loop cycle. If not, I'm going to have some very nasty words for Electronic Arts come come tomorrow <laughs> morning. <clears throat> so uh, with Metroid, did you play the old school on the brick, you know, way back when? or? Uh, as I mentioned, my first experience with metroid was prime but mm -hmm. fusion came out for the game boy advance that same year i think like a couple of days apart and you could connect the two of them together to get more stuff okay so i played the original metroid through fusion i think that was what you unlocked in fusion okay. if you had both games so i played the original metroid there I didn't play the second one, which was for the the old brick Game Boy, mm -hmm. uh, for years and years and years. And I eventually found it in a pawn shop somewhere and tried it. And that game has not aged well <laughs> at all. <laughs> I gave up halfway through. Uh, but I, I, I guess I've technically replayed it because I played the, um, the 3DS version, Samus Returns. And I also played the unofficial fan remake am2r uh another metroid 2 remake which came out at the same time as the 3ds game so i got the chance to uh to relive those moments and to finally finish that game at that point okay yeah uh i i, I apologize when my brain works i just i have a thought and it shoots it out and I, I hear what you're saying but at the same time i'm always thinking of that next thing to talk about and sometimes the brain just doesn't, it just doesn't click. You know, the hamster sometimes just sees that second wheel and goes to it. So now you, would, uh, I know Nintendo is like notorious for dumping or dunking on people who uh, do remakes, who end up, uh, uh, you know, making mods and ports. So how did the, the unofficial fan version get made and how did they get away with it? Is it taken down or... That is a great question. So there was a, a lot of controversy when 
the the fan remake came out about um nintendo issuing a cease and desist order essentially and i i think that it did have to be taken down obviously in this age of the internet that means essentially nothing because file sharing is what it is it's possible to get the game um but it was a hard push by nintendo and i think that it was at least partly because they were releasing their own remake of the same game in the Ah. same year so they were um really militant about making sure that they were protecting their intellectual property uh, pro- presumably for that reason yeah nintendo is is uh, is uh, they should figure out how they do their military you know, if we could take a page out of their playbook for the militaries the, the of, <laughs> there'd be a lot more success uh, god i was trying to formulate there something. would be only one make of gun and you'd have to use it for seven years <laughs> and no one else could use any other make yeah so when it comes, I, I've kind of, I just randomly had this thought here, uh, Metroid and Mega Man. Um, I, I know they both have the hand cannons, you know, they both wear the suits of armor. Although, you know, Mega Man is a man and Metroid is Samus. And, you know, like, how long did it take you before you, okay, two questions. How long did it take you before you realized Metroid uh, was Samus was a female? And then how, uh, how similar do you think Mega Man and Metroid kind of were in terms of each other? That, uh, another great question. I think, for me, um, because I got into Metroid after the series had already been out for so long, like, Super Metroid, I think, uh, the third game for the Super Nintendo, was the one where people sort of realized, whoa, Samus is a girl, because every time you die, her armor explodes off her, and you see the long, flowing really? golden hair, and things like that. So I was... Um, By the time I entered the Metroid series, I was already sort of culturally aware that Samus was a female character. Um, And I've always loved the idea of uh, of a diverse array of experiences and, and living through that in games is really fascinating. And I think we don't get enough of that. Um, there are so many games where I sort of have to roll my eyes and say, okay, so this protagonist is just like all of these other protagonists. Nathan Drake is just Indiana Jones is just, etc. Yeah. And like Samus is a, a really fun character for that reason. Like she is someone who obviously has her own backstory and uh, has been through her own struggles, but is still capable and stoic and just a total badass throughout all of the games. So I was really drawn to that aspect of her in the Prime games in particular, where they um, explore a little bit more of like her backstory and, and the, um, the prophecies that surround her in the lore of that series. As for Mega Man, that whole rivalry totally escaped me. Like, I, I knew some kids who were into Mega Man, and they were really into Mega Man. But that series as a whole was just not culturally on my radar, because I wasn't an NES guy where the first five Mega Mans or whatever came out. I wasn't really into the Super Nintendo, and so by the time I got into gaming with the N64 and the GameCube, like, I there was this big uh, hiatus in Mega Man um, and they were still doing games for the Game Boy and things like that but they weren't as big uh, releases by I think is it Capcom who does uh, yeah, Mega Capcom. Man? Capcom. Um, so they weren't like these cultural events where this new Mega Man game was coming out and everyone got super hyped so I was uh, aware of Mega Man as a as a figure and as a series, but I didn't really have any opinions on it, if that makes <laughs> sense. Uh, no, yeah. Just because it so wasn't part of my uh, my gaming lexicon. No, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, like, I never really... The only Metroid I played was that brick, you know, the the one way back on the brick, and then I'd see her pop up every so often, and then, like like yourself, I, uh, I actually learned a little bit later on, believe it or not, that metroid was or samus was a was a woman and at that point it kind of clicked in my mind where i was like yes that's perfect because um 
I, I mention this all the time in my podcast, and I'm sure the listeners may be sick of hearing it, but anytime I can play as a female character, I do. I hate how every main, like, there's there's a typical female character, and then there's someone like Samus, you know, where it's just, she's fully decked out in armor, you have no idea who she is, like, I, you know, obviously it was too young to understand, but as soon as I understood, I was like, that's kind of cool, you know, like, uh, for Skyrim, there's a mod that basically d de- sexifies a lot of the female characters uh, uniforms and i was like yes please so yeah because i know the vampires got the you know where it's like basically showing the huge busty corset and then really it's just covered up shaded really nice it looks like legit actual armor which i i greatly appreciate because i get sex appeal i understand it but bro tone it tone it down (laughs) tone it down um i have to ask then because you bring up the Wii. um like, what do you play on the Wii? Ah, oh, man, it has been a while since I played anything on the Wii. Um, I think I actually have a Wii U. Okay. So I, the thing that I was uh, very obsessed with for a long time was uh, the Mario Karts. So Mario Kart 8, um, I still think, is the best of the Mario Karts. People always say that Mario Kart 64 is the best one. I think that those people are deluded and <laughs> blinded by nostalgia. Um, I, I confess I was also in that era more of a crash team racing guy. So I have a a bit of, uh, animosity towards Mario Kart 64 (laughs) just as a result of that. But, um, on the Wii, I, um, I played Metro Prime 3, of course, Corruption came out for the Wii, uh, great game, a little more linear than the series has sort of been up until that point, but still very good. Um, I first played uh, Twilight Princess, the Zelda game on the Wii. That was the first uh, system that I played it on, though it came out for the GameCube as well. Um, uh, other than that, I I played the Galaxy game, Super Mario Galaxy. Um, I've always been into platformers, like those Twitch platformers where you have to be really careful about your movement and and really exact in it, and those were just such beautifully uh, orchestrated games. I mean, both literally because they had wonderful orchestral musical scores, yeah. but also just in the way that they handled and the way that they uh, they designed their levels around this three-dimensional space in a way that people hadn't really seen before. Um, those were absolutely amazing. So, sort of, I guess my answer is the flagship Nintendo franchises, the Metroids, the Zeldas, the Marios. Because uh, a lot of the stuff that came out for the Wii was just cash grab shovelware where the the waggle sort of just worked and half the time you were you were fighting against the system with <laughs> terrible graphics. So, you had to be really selective about what you played on the Wii, but there was some great stuff. Yeah. With the, because uh, I was curious if you did a lot of the Wii Sports. Um... I got super into Wii Sports Golf yeah. uh, for a while. I don't know what it was about the golf game, but it just was so satisfying. So I, I spent a, way longer than I had ever planned to playing Wii Sports Golf and the golf on the Wii Sports Resort when that yeah, came out. Wii Sports Plus. Resort. I, because, uh, you know, like, like I've, I've mentioned to everybody, I'm in Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, you can't really golf during the winter, and you can't really play disc golf. Sure. So yep. when one of my ex-girlfriends had the Wii, I think it was just the uh, original Wii, or maybe it was the Wii U, but we could play disc golf. You know, we'd play rounds of disc golf together, and we got really, really good at it. And it was a fun alternative. It was most definitely a fun alternative. Um, the Wii bowling was weird. I never understood it. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah, that look tells me all, all I need to know about that. Yeah, man. Like, I see the concept, and I love the idea of you releasing the button to release the ball, but it was just not quite honed enough uh, at the time that we released to to really work satisfyingly. So I've kind of noticed the the pattern of games that you end up playing. Um, I'm curious, because you you said you have an N64, which is, I I love the N64. The N64 is a brilliant system. Um, Do you play Goldeneye? That is a uh, a great question, and the answer is no. I never played Goldeneye. I now own it because everyone talks about it as like this this be all end all of that era of first person shooters. But by the time that I ended up playing it, 
again, like it was, we were in the mid to late 2000s and Halo 3 had come out and all of these other <laughs> games had come out. And I was like, oh, cool. I've played uh, first person shooters. I've played like couch multiplayer first person shooters. I hear that GoldenEye is great. And I tried it and the the backwards learning curve was just too much for me to really get into. Um, so on the N64, I was really more into stuff like uh, Paper Mario. That was mm -hmm. more my jam. Yeah, I had a I, I had a buddy who was like hardcore retro. Like he had never uh, played a Fallout game before. He had never played a lot of the main consoles. And so one day I went over to his house. I brought over my 360. I let him play Fallout 4 for a couple hours. And he's like, hey, man, let's go ahead and do a first person shooter. I was like, great. He's like, let's go to a Golden. I was like. I was okay. I was okay. And, uh, you know, like, I just remember doing everything I can do now on Battlefield 4, you know, versus now I'm on this tiny little thing. And it's just, it was just mind blowing how good he was at that and remembering, oh, that's right. This is how video games used to be. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Back in the dark ages of only a single joystick. <laughs> I, it, it was, I got, I don't even think I killed him once. I think I got him down to like 25% health and that was about the best I did. And he had a lot of fun, which I had fun with that. <laughs> I, I got, I got slapped around for about two hours and it was all right. It was all right. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're having a good time with your friends, it's a successful gaming session, right? That was the only reason why I kept going is because I was playing with him and it was making him happy. So great. Yeah. Um, out of, out of curiosity, what uh because it, it definitely sounds like you have a genre like you know i've, I've said this before what's the kind of game that maybe you've played before or maybe that you're kind of playing now that really detracts from almost what it sounds like is a lot of those crash bandicoot style games where it's kind of 2d in a 3d-ish world um when you ask that do you mean something that i am playing that is so totally like anathema to that concept or um could you maybe restate the question i'm gonna ask you to ex to tell me what that word meant that you just said because <laughs> i uh, yes it just means like the opposite of or oh, in okay. in opposition to I i'm learned stratton but i'm not i'm not british learned all right man like <laughs> you gotta take it down a few pegs my man <laughs> Um, cause I used the word annotated yesterday while talking to one of my supervisors and I got laughed at for about five minutes. So that, uh, yeah, so I gotta, you know, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so like I'm a big first person shooter. I'm all about shooting guns. I'm all about blowing stuff up. But then you take a look at a game like, you know, Battlefield 4, uh, Call of Duty, uh, you know, uh, Fortnite. And then I say, I like to play for, I, I like to play Minecraft. Minecraft is a very calming okay. game. It's not really about battle. It's more about building. It's a, a stark contrast to what I normally play. Do you have any games that are a very stark contrast to the normal games that you would play? Or Yeah, I think if I had to typify my gaming preferences, um, I really like platforming games and adventure games where you sort of build up your experience and your uh, skill set over the course of the game. And that can be in terms of items that you get in the game that, that vary the moveset that you get, or just that you become more and more proficient in the game as you go. Um, and that allows you to do more things with the same rules that you had previously. So I think if there's a game that uh, has sort of captured my interest that is totally different than that. I think that a good example of that might be, man, I'm trying to think, like, maybe the Professor Layton games. Um, they are the series of puzzle games that came out for the DS uh, ages back, and they um, are just that same kind of thing as Animal Crossing for me, where they are not stressful in any sense and you just sort of play them at your own pace and do your own thing and you're still i guess having to to figure things out but it's a much more linear almost visual novel style story where you just sort of wander along and tap things with 
the stylus <laughs> until something happens and then you go oh cool i get to do a puzzle <laughs> amazing and then you spend five minutes failing desperately at a puzzle until you succeed it later okay um i okay yeah i had a i had a random thought in there um that with what something with how you said something and i'm gonna ask you to do something a little bit later on but it's it's not related to gaming um do you remember i think it was the show wild berries or uh, the wild thornberries the wild thornberries there we go you know where i'm going with that don't you i have a feeling i do and okay. i've actually been asked to oh. do this before <laughs> you know what let's just get it out of the way please indulge my dumb little fantasy uh, so Nigel Thornberry yeah. is played by the magnificent Tim Curry, a great British actor. Um, and I have been asked many times by some friends of mine to say the word smashing that he says in a very specific tone of voice. And uh, the way that he says it is smashing. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to... Uh, pimp you out like that or whore you out like that but <laughs> that was uh, I, I heard you say it and I was like I remember that from my childhood and I need that right meow <laughs> I'm sorry I'm sorry no, I, look, anyone who is willing to put me on the same level as Tim Curry I am just flattered by the comparison okay okay yeah Tim Curry I love that man I don't I, I, if I find something that he's in and I don't realize it, I feel dumb and I love it instantly. That, mm. that man is just mm, primo. Uh, <sighs> one of the things that Lindsay and I do every year is rewatch uh, the short miniseries Over the Garden Wall. Um, it's a, an animated series starring Elijah Wood and um, the guy who plays Doc Brown in uh, the Back to the Future films is in it. There are all of these great voice actors, John Cleese, and Tim Curry plays a role in that that is just brilliant, and it gets me every time. It's so different from what he usually plays that it always takes me a moment to realize that it's him, but it makes me so happy when I do. So uh, it, I totally get what you're talking about. How did I not hear about this? Over the Garden Wall. No, I... Over the Garden Wall, really good. It's 10 episodes, but each episode is only 10 minutes. So it's you watch a series as a movie, essentially. Oh. It's an evening's worth of content. It's just great. I've actually seen photos from Over the Garden Wall. I've, I, I remember these characters. I don't, I don't know why it never grabbed my attention, but yeah, if I would have known uh, the, the legend himself was in it, I probably would have not passed that up. Especially Elijah Wood, too. I think he's kind of a... I, I like to see him in something other than what he's typecast in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah, I totally get that. All right. Um, so you had said you'd played God of War for the PlayStation 3? Yeah. Um, so I, I came into God of War uh, in a sort of way that I guess a lot of people... Uh, come into games where they don't own the console, uh, and this was at a friend's house. I played the original God of War with with this friend and his brother over the course of like a two-day sleepover where we didn't actually sleep and we just played video games. Like we played a bunch of Mortal Kombat and we played a God of War. And for the longest time, like that was my only experience with it was that first God of War game um, until I got a PS3 and found god of war 3 in a bargain bin for five dollars towards the end of the console's life cycle and i was like oh yeah i remember this series this was really fun so i buy that and i start playing it and i'm blown away in the way that i think <laughs> it was when they first experienced uh the graphical jump between the ps2 and the ps3 and god of war sort of really exemplified that um so I w was totally enraptured with the the combat of God of War, and it sort of does that same thing where, like, your moveset doesn't really change over the game, but you just get better at killing all of these fantastic creatures. <laughs> um, and so I really had a great time and ended up buying the the other God of War collections. I think they made one for God of War 1 and 2, and then they did one for the PS3 that was the two PSP games, and then there was a... God of War Ascension or something like that. Uh, so there are six God of War games on the PS3, and I have just been uh, mowing through all kinds of uh, creatures that I'm sure have 
rich and fulfilling lives outside of being killed by Kratos. <laughs> have you uh, have you seen the gentleman behind Kratos's voice? I have. I, I think didn't they switch voice actors between the um, the originals and this new God of War? I guess it's not technically God of War Four; it's just called God of War. Yeah. But both of them look like total badasses, and uh, I want to be their friends. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember hearing his voice, and then. Uh, like I, I was a big fan of Dragon Ball Z for the longest uh-huh. time, and I remember, you know, one time it just it sparked me, and I was like, "Oh, let's look up the voice actors." And you look up the voice actors, and it's like, "Oh, what about Halo? What about this? What about that?" And I got to God of War, and I was just like jaw dropped because it just he has his, I think it would be called like a guttural, deep, just manly man's voice, and you're just like, you're like, that's how he talks? That's insane. Yeah, so like he's he's a they're both demons in their own rights and I would very much like to know them. <laughs> yeah. Um have you uh have you thought about upgrading to a PlayStation 4? I you can go ahead and take a sip of your president. I can I can elaborate a little <laughs> bit more. The the mm. reason why I ask is because I I never I, I was a PlayStation fanboy, jumped to Xbox, and then I kind of made the jump back to PlayStation Four when Spider Man was announced, and I it was an ex- Spider Man has always been exclusive for PlayStation, and I love Spider Man. I love swinging around the city and all that other fun stuff. So, have you found any game that maybe tickles your fancy to want to jump to a PlayStation Four? You know, I nearly had that experience with the PS4 when it was first announced, and I was a huge fan of the Infamous games for the PS3, mm-hmm. um, and Infamous Second Son was one of the first like flagship titles for the PS4, and it just looked amazing. And then it came out, and it had sort of middling reviews, and I was like, okay, I don't need to buy this now. Yeah. I can wait. And that wait has just sort of continued in perpetuity. Um I, I don't know whether there's anything for the PS4 or the PS5 that has just grabbed me and shouted in my face that I need to play it. Um, Spider-Man, I, Spider-Man is one of my favorite comic book characters of all time. I can wax lyrically about his back catalog for ages. but uh, So that is something that looks fantastic and I would love to play eventually. Um, but the... The way that uh, it's sort of worked out is that all of the series that I used to be really attached to for the PS3 generation, the the Assassin's Creed and um, the Uncharted's, things like that, have just, uh, they've all shifted in their focus in a way that like doesn't make me as excited to invest as I was before. So I've heard about games like Ghost of Tsushima and the the new God of War and all of these great games for this later generation, Red Dead Redemption 2. Like I hear about all these things and they all sound great, but both in terms of time commitment and fiscal money commitment, uh, there's nothing that has really said this is worth it at that moment. And I guess the thing that really did it for the Switch was Animal Crossing, right? Yeah. Like, Breath of the Wild came out and I didn't buy a Switch, and Mario Odyssey came out and I didn't buy a Switch, and finally Animal Crossing came and it's like, okay, I care about this enough to make that investment, and there just hasn't quite been anything like that for these other systems where I felt like I I needed to give up other parts of my life to make sure that I had time to invest in these things. I like that style of thinking a lot. Because <clears throat> there are games that I have bought, you know, on Steam sale for like two ninety nine. Because they've they've been that peak interest where I'm like, that looks fun enough, that looks good enough, but can I justify the twenty five dollars or what have you? And then when they go on sale for you know next to nothing, I'm like, I can just you know like okay, maybe I don't go to Denny's this weekend, or or maybe I don't go to you know don't go out to eat this week, and I can have this game. And next thing you know, there's a Battlefield twenty forty two coming out. And all of a sudden, I'm going to be investing in that. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because in Fallout 4, a game that has been out since 2015, and I'll put it to you this way. I had a surgery uh, the day the day after Fallout 4 came out. So I, I bought Fallout, I got it at like a midnight release or something like that. Went in the next day, had my surgery, and then I was supposed to stay off my feet for a couple of days. 
What a more perfect game to play through and run through. I have been playing Fallout 4 since its release in 2015, and I am still, still finding brand new things I have never found out before. Um, Amazing. I, I've, I decided to start a new series called Can You Beat Fallout 4, and I try to like do it a bunch of different ways. And I've learned at least half a dozen, if not a dozen new things already in my four, play, four or five playthroughs I've already done. So, you know, when you're talking about a game like Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption 2, I've played it. I've still, like, I've not even touched the surface of what other people have done. So I, I understand it. I think you need to be a little bit more gamer-esque and, you know, add <laughs> into, you know, give up some of that time. But, like, that's me. You know, I'm the kind of guy who logs out from work and immediately queues up a game as I'm making dinner. You know, I've got my Philip DeFranco I listen to. And then as I'm listening to Philip DeFranco, I'm cooking dinner. All right, done. I'm eating as the game's loading up. And then I, I start eating as, as I'm loading my character. And then I just go for the next eight, nine hours. And it's it's terrible and i know why i'm single so <laughs> you know I, I i definitely understand that man um kind of want to touch on some other stuff here because we've been talking about games for a little while so you, you you said you wanted to talk about your life story and i'm very interested in how this works so you were born in aussie and then your dad was british how long did you stay in australia uh when i was born um i lived in australia for a month and then left to go to England. Uh, <laughs> so it's one of those things where it is very technically I am Australian and I still have an Australian passport and like can go back and forward whenever. And I did move back later in my childhood and lived there for a couple of years in a way that makes me feel more legitimately Australian, like I know what Tim Tams are, and I have experienced Vegemite in its natural environment, stuff like that that <laughs> everyone sort of talks about. Um, but yeah, like that month is very emblematic for my life since then, where uh, we have just sort of been like, okay, this is this is nice. I'm getting to know this thing, and oh no, we're off. Okay. Uh, life yeah. is uprooted. Go somewhere else. Do something else, and have a great time doing it. Have a wonderful family structure that surrounded me this whole time. But uh, it, it was just uh, surreal to be carted off to wherever we were going next and, and to sort of lose my, my life beforehand. So uh, where did you live in Australia, if I, if I can inquire? Yeah, so I was born in Melbourne, um, uh, which is in Victoria in the uh, southeastern part of Australia. But when we moved back and lived there in a more stable capacity, for a couple of years, uh, I lived in Brisbane, which is in Queensland. And it's on the East Coast, sort of halfway up, if you're looking at a map of Australia. It's just at sort of the lower end of the state of Queensland. Okay. Um, uh, when uh, Steve Irwin, there we go. I should know that right off the bat. He's my favorite, all-time favorite gentleman in the, in, in the world. He is, he's so pure of heart, and I, I could gush about him for hours. Um, did you ever visit uh, his his zoo there? Did you? I did, and I actually saw him in person uh, wrestling some crocodiles and and giving a talk. So uh, this was right before he unfortunately passed away. We had moved back to Australia, and uh, Australia Zoo, which was the zoo that he uh, was such a great ambassador for, uh, is quite close to Brisbane. So we had gone out there and patted some wallabies and wombats and. Uh, been scared by some cassowaries and, and saw Steve Irwin uh, give a talk and um, really be such a great ambassador for these marvelous animals. Uh, so he, that was a special experience. Was he just as awesome as you see on the TV? Was that, did it translate to real world or? It's, uh, seeing something like that in real life is such a different experience because in so many ways, television is an intimate experience where the camera is often so close to the people, whether through Zoom or physically, um, that you feel like you're standing there talking to them or, or being in the same room as them. But when you're in an actual location with someone like Steve Irwin and he is in uh, the center where there is this fenced off crocodile pit and he's in the middle of it, grabbing something's jaws and telling you about how many teeth it has. And you are, experiencing this with 
hundred plus people who were st- sitting in stadium seats along the side, it's such a different experience. Um, that I don't know whether I could say that it lived up to my expectations, having experienced Steve Irwin in, in television form and in that sort of like intimate, he's talking to me through the camera way. Yeah. That it was just very different. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I remember I went to a, uh, live, uh, I, I guess you would call it heavy metal show once. And, uh, there's this electronic electronic grunge band i forget who they were but it was down in madison wisconsin and i loved the show beyond a shadow of the doubt i was like yes and they were like hey we got a couple of cds we're selling i just i ended out like 30 bucks or something like that i got a couple other cds and then uh, a couple days later i popped them into the cd player yes i'm that old and uh, all of a sudden it was just like this is not the same this is not i it doesn't you know uh, so I, I i can i can understand the um, not the exposition, but I know what you're talking about, where you take yourself out of that environment and it's just one is totally different than the other. So. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you make because I have had the inverse experience where I have loved an artist through their albums. Um, uh, you may be aware of an electronic music duo called Porter Robinson and uh, Madion. I've heard of They're them, two- yeah. Yeah, I think Porter is American, I think, and Medion might be French, and they are like uh, quote unquote techno electronic, <laughs> but more sort of like indie and experimental, and um, they've done a really good job of evolving over their careers, but that's not the point. Uh, the, <laughs> I had sort of formed my opinion of their music by listening to it by myself in quiet spaces and like feeling it in that way and then i went to see them in concert and it was a totally different experience and i hated it i hated it so much because everyone was jumping and i didn't want to jump i wanted to sit and be in their music in a way that it was apparent to me that that's not the way that other people had experienced them or um grown to love the work that they do and i think that that kind of context is uh really fascinating and so individual um it's funny that you mentioned that because i kind of got two different stories uh number one you know metallica right yes yeah um i've been to two of their concerts the first concert i went to was with my buddy luke uh who i've actually kind of fallen out of because you know you get a different job and then you know so like uh uh i was like hey luke Minneapolis, the new stadium is opening up. I'm going to Metallica. I asked a bunch of people to come. He was the only one who said he wanted to go, which was awesome. And we were in the we were in the thing, and people were jumping around. They were pumping their fists. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, pumping my fist to whom the bell tolls. And at that moment, I realized, oh, I might be ruining this, ruining for this for Luke. And I look over at Luke, and he's doing the same thing, you know. And and you know, I looked around the stadium that we were in and you know there were people who like yourself who were just sitting down taking in the music and i can see how that would be distracting with a bunch of us metalheads just losing you know our minds screaming at the top of our lungs you know to the lyrics so that that can that can be a little different it's it's always indicative of to how crazy two different people can enjoy the same thing at the same time um you ever heard of hype metal I have heard of both of those words individually, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't say I know of them as a genre. I, I've never heard of hype metal before, and there was this band called 36 Crazy Fists. So what hype metal basically is, is that they record a song, just like anybody else, they put it on the album, and then they speed it up in concerts. So it's kind of like listening to a podcast at, you know, like you, you hear somebody talking at regular speed, and then you speed them up to one and a half or one and a, one and a quarter, and that's kind of what it's like. It's very off-putting. It's mm-hmm. very odd because there's that timing, that rhythm that you get, and then when it's sped up just that hair, you're like, something's not right, and it you know it, it throws you off. And uh, I I had that same that same effect where I heard them live, and I was like, mm, no, no sir, I will pass. Thank you very much. So uh, I understand that. I get you. I get you. Oh, okay. Uh, to do. Okay, so you're you're mo- you move. Sorry, we got very sidetracked there. Uh, so you were in Australia, 
and then you moved to Britain, or you moved to England, I should say. How, uh, where were you in England, if you care to share? What was, what was life like between sunny, beautiful Australia to the gloom and doom that is the UK? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the the story is unfortunately much more complex than uh, than is uh, narratively satisfying for <laughs> <laughs> for a five minute story. Yeah. Um, but when I was living in England when I was young, I was in uh, Reading, which is just to the southwest of London. Um, and I'm sure that if you have any English listeners, they'll be a little bit pedantic about exactly the geography of the area, but that's the general gist of it. Yeah, the, the 1% uh, that listen from the UK can get all messy. <laughs> I don't, that's their 1%, it's whatever. Um, and and we, we had a really lovely home there, but it's one of those things that I only really remember through our home videos of it. Um, and so I went to like very young primary school and I had a friend there whose name is Michael, but who was called Spike at that time. <laughs> and we were born one day apart. Um, so when my parents moved to England uh, and my mum found his mum, we were sort of uh, forced to become friends. And luckily it worked out really well <laughs> uh, and remains so to this day. Um, and so, so I had that little bit of a social circle, a little bit of a schooling experience before we ended up moving away and back again. Um, I didn't move back to the UK until must have been 2014 when I went there to um, to pursue a uh, my graduate studies in uh, the museum world, which is what I currently do for work. Uh, when I moved to Leicester, uh, which is in the West Midlands in the UK, sort of halfway up the country in the centre. Um, absolutely beautiful town, uh, lovely culture. They had just won the um, the National Football Cup, the Leicester Tigers had, so the city was uh, jumping in the way that it had not been <laughs> for ages and ages and probably is not now at this moment, unfortunately. I don't think they're doing quite as well. Um, <laughs> So my second experience of living in the UK was very different to my first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. Um, with the, uh, I, I thought you were going to continue there. I, I, I like I like stories. I'm I'm very if I can listen to a stories and not have my dumb face talk at people. Sometimes it's, <laughs> that's why I have people on. I, I try to have people on so it's not just me spouting my nonsense that I find on the internet. Um, so you work in museums now? Is is what you do? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I uh, studied history for my undergrad and then went to Leicester in the UK to pursue a graduate degree in museum studies, which is a sort of more general um, course that covers things like being a museum curator, a museum educator, um, collections management, and, and sort of really helps you to define what exactly you want to do in a museum so you know you want to go to a museum and you want to work there yeah. but what exactly do you want to do Th this course is essentially like an overview of all of the different aspects of running a museum because many museums we sort of think of museums as being these massive huge institutions that take up a city block and contain billions of dollars worth of art or dinosaurs or whatever but many museums are, are teeny tiny things who have two employees and no funding. And so uh, everyone has to do everything. Uh, um, so that kind of general education really serves those people uh, who make up the vast majority of museum workers. So uh, I went there and I studied uh, museum studies and eventually focused in collections management and curation. Um, I ended up working after that for the Imperial War Museum, which is a, a large sort of museum syndicate in the UK that has a couple of different branches. And I worked at the Air Force Museum at Duxford, uh, which is a, an old World War II Air Force base that was converted into a museum after the Second World War um, and contains everything from like Spitfires to early aircraft to tanks to there's a Concorde there which was a very famous jetliner 
in the uh, 70s through the 90s and was eventually retired. But a very famous profile of this this jet with this very thin nose. Um, so that's where I sort of cut my teeth in the museum world. I now still work at a museum here in Houston, Texas. I work for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston um, in their archives, uh, which is a little bit different than collections management, but is uh, related enough that it keeps it interesting. The Imperial, what was it? The Imperial? The Imperial War Museum. That sounds so baller. Number two, <laughs> I was Air Force in, in, in my six year military career. So that's super cool that you got to work with that, especially with the Concorde. That plane is iconic for everything like that. Just I could ask you thousands of questions about that because I love World War II. My stepdad loves World War II. I watch every freaking documentary I can. You just like, oh, oh, man, like that's so cool. <laughs> Uh, one of my jobs when I was at Duxford uh, was, because uh, I was there as a collections assistant, um, making sure that the uh, collections were well documented in the records so that they had a good idea of A, what they had, and B, how much space it took up. One of my jobs was measuring all of the aircraft. So I literally got a tape measure and I had to sit in and around a measure smith as I was standing there with a the tape measure saying, okay, it's this tall, it's this wide. Um, so I got very well acquainted with all of the aircraft and all of the tanks there. I love the I love the British and their name for things. It is just so regal. It sounds just <laughs> so. Oh my god! I just I love the I love the Brits and what they do. Like it's. I know we have some very um very complex feelings about imperialism, like as a concept now. <laughs> but the the name is great. Well, I mean, it, it, Duxworth is is the name of the town you were in. Duxford. Duxford. D -X -F -O -R -D. Sorry. D X F O R D. I'm yeah, just just outside Cambridge. Oh, just like ever, like I'm getting an adrenaline rush for listening about all this cool stuff. It's like, first it's Steve Irwin. Now it's like, oh, guess what? I did things for the Air Force with World War Two, and it's just like you were hitting. I'm um, like, I would totally date you. Like you would just be if if <laughs> if, if you if. Sorry, I'm taken, mate. I, I know you're taken, but like, it's just like you were touched. Like this is the conversations that I'd love to have with people, man. Like it's just so awesome. Oh my god, okay, ducks, like, oh god, just, like, I can't, like, I'm jumping so fast between everything, I just can't remember what you're saying, oh my god. Uh, I had a cousin who did art restoration for a number of years on some very, very old paintings, so she, that kind of touched, you know, that kind of fiddled the fiddle there for a little bit, but, like, World War, II, oh man, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm geeking out about the World War II stuff, I gotta stop, I, I apologize. Oh man, um. Uh, okay, I'm gonna ask you one thing. What was the favorite part about working uh, at, with the, at Duxford? Like, what was the coolest thing you got to do with that museum? Oh man. Um, or if you don't, if you can't pick, just tell me. Yeah, me, me like I, I, I was only there for a short amount of time. Like I was there for uh, five months. It was a, a temporary position, unfortunately. Um, so I can tell you definitely the favorite thing that I ended up doing, uh, I'll say two. Um, a, just working in and around these amazing aircraft was fantastic. Like I got to send photos to my dad, who was a huge World War II buff of like, oh, hey, here I am sitting in a Spitfire. <laughs> oh, hey, here I am underneath the Spruce Goose. Here I am doing this stuff, uh, which was absolutely amazing. Um, but the other thing that I did that is more sort of low key uh, important to me as a person and who's as someone who loves history is I spend a lot of time cataloging the film collections oh. uh, for the museum and in one sense it's a terrible job like it's okay. awful because all of this film is on nitrate and I don't know if you know anything about nitrate film but it is high explosive yep so it's all kept in refrigerators uh, so I had to go into a refrigerator every day and I'd be shivering. It'd be summer outside, uh, but I'd have to be wearing a, a coat and I'd be wearing gloves, but I'd have to cut the fingers off all the gloves so that I could affix the labels to these film reels. So my fingertips were blue by the end of the day and I had to come out every hour for a hot cup of tea. Otherwise, things would start going terribly wrong. But the work that I did there and the work that continued to be done after I left to catalog all of these films and make sure that they are 
properly described and available to researchers and, and people who want to digitize them, that kind of stuff goes unsung in the museum world and it is so, so important. So in terms of my favorite thing that I did there, in terms of what might have a big impact in the future, like that is huge. Yeah, I, I can tell you that the World War II documentaries, when you see the colorized black and whites or just even the black and white footage, um, especially when it's something that they're actually talking about and not just some random war footage, it's astonishing. Just to, just to like, I mean, this is, you know, this was the pinnacle back then. Uh, you know, this was the, the start of something amazing where we could finally see what was actually going on, what was really, you know, happening. And it's just, it it's awe-inspiring to see people who are now, you know, deceased or either very, very old mm. performing feats that are above and beyond what any normal human would be asked to, especially in such an insane circumstance. And it just, it's an, it's impressive. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Like that's, that's awesome. It's amazing. I love that stuff. That's so cool. Uh, it was a, an absolutely fantastic experience to have. And, and if you're, any of your listeners are interested in stuff like that, there is a great documentary which came out in maybe the 50s or the 60s. It's a short, maybe six-part documentary from the BBC called Now It Can Be Told, uh, where they interviewed pilots, soldiers, generals, admirals from both sides of the war uh, the English and the Germans about their experiences in World War Two and the the things that they went through and the things that they were willing to talk about so candidly after the fact are just awe inspiring um, what people went through to uh, during those years. Yeah, it it's that mind blowing. I I would ne like. I've been overseas to Iraq, Afghanistan, and I was lucky enough that I stayed on base the vast majority of the time. Um, and uh, I, I'd said there, there were a few times where I was put in a position to where I, I could have had to do something that I didn't really want to do. But I thank God and I, I you know, I, I think a higher power, I should say, you know, for anybody out there who's listening, that I didn't have to do what a lot of people have had to do. And I count my blessings every day for it because I know a lot of my brothers and sisters came back with PTSD. In fact, I lost one to PTSD. I almost lost another one. But it just, it, I can't stress it enough that just like, the things some people did and how they did it just i can't even imagine you know just the the mentality that they oh uh, okay <sighs> all right that's so deep that's so dark i don't like that let's, let's fluff it up let's let's shake out our tail feathers you know let's get a little loosey-goosey there sir uh i think it's time that we talk about some dumb stuff huh how does that how does, how does <laughs> sounds that sounds good to me all right um I know Lindsay really enjoyed this uh, part, so let's hope you enjoy it too. I almost, I almost want to say, get her on in here and see what, see what she might think of some dumb stuff, but I don't want to spoil the fun. Let's see here. Uh, oh, well, I got so many videos, so many dumb videos. Oh, okay, so many, so many weird things. Oh, kidoki smoky. Ch okay, so let me ask you this. Um, how long have you and Lindsay been dating? Just kind of like a rough estimate here. We've been dating for about three and a half years now. Okay, so you, you've been out of the dating game for a minute then. Yeah. Okay. Because I was going to, I was going to ask you what your, uh, what your thoughts are. Like, I, I didn't know how long you guys were dating because like I, I'm on everything. I'm on, you know, I, not, I'm not on like playing fish or Cupid, but I'm on Tinder. I'm on Bumble. I'm on all those places. So it's gonna be like, hey, what are your thoughts on the way dating is in the in the, the world today? And <laughs> no, you've been removed for so long, you probably don't. Yeah, even know I mean, I is. I definitely experienced that. Like before Lindsay and I were together, I was on the apps. Uh, I was on Tinder. I was on OK Cupid, and. I, I didn't end up on Bumble, though it was another one I was considering. So, mm -hmm. man, that whole thing, it was just a grind. Uh, not pleasant at all. And I'm very glad that I met Lindsay through other channels than that. I don't know if she talked about this on her episode, but our meeting was entirely uh, fortuitous and, and without intention. So... Uh, we we really lucked out by meeting each other that way because man those apps are not fun. <laughs> yeah, I uh, 
I am lucky enough that I think I've I got a rescheduled first date with a with a lovely uh, older lady. Um, well, not older lady. I think she's around my age. But yeah, this is this is attempt number two at the first date. Hopefully Saturday it, it's gonna it's gonna rock and roll. Um, otherwise, if not, it, it could just be another beautiful disaster. But I'll play disc golf either way, so who cares? <laughs> All right, uh, so I got this. Uh, sorry, I, I saved a bunch of stuff, and I was gonna try to do videos and incorporate it, and then I just got lost with time because I'm uh, procrastinate like that. So uh, this gentleman here, Arctic CP, asks us the question: So my flatmate and I always sit very close to each other, or at sometimes touching arms while watching Netflix on the sofa. When she's drunk, she's always uh, she always goes to hold my hand. So does this mean anything, or am I misreading it? That is tough. Um, I know that some people just are more physically affectionate when they have had a couple of drinks. Um, so I don't want to like make any assumptions on the part of this this woman. But the way that uh, this question asker is phrasing this question suggests that there might be other instances of like this kind of affection in their lives outside of this. Like this isn't a one-off thing. This is a pattern of behavior that suggests mm -hmm. that there might be something. So I guess you have to be prepared in this, as in all things, right? For it to blow up in your face and to go terribly. Yeah. So like, if you want to sit down and have a discussion about this, then you can. And that is a perfectly valid way to start a relationship. People always assume that relationships start in the way that they start in movies, where there's this massive declaration, or there's this <laughs> prompt you first kiss, or some kind of gesture that demonstrates that you've been harboring these feelings the whole time. But that puts the other person on the spot in a way that is so uncomfortable for them that even if they might be receptive, there's a possibility that they'll just freeze up. So if you if you don't want to go that route and don't want to like act on the hand touching while you're kissing, which I while while you you're drinking together, <laughs> uh, if, if you're already kissing, disregard my advice. <laughs> I think you've made it. Yeah, I, th I think we know what's going on, Stratton. If they're kissing. Yeah, fair enough. But if you're drinking and you you want to take things further, <sighs> consent is so tricky in many cases. Anyway. I, I personally would not feel comfortable acting on something like that when someone's judgment might be impaired. But if you think that there is a connection here and a chemistry, then sitting them down when you're both sober, you live together, obviously you must be able to communicate in some respect, otherwise the dishes don't get done, right? Like uh, this, there has to be some kind of rapport where you can be open with each other and honest about your needs then you, you have to just like lay it out there and say, if this is something that I'm not misreading, then I think this is something that I'd be interested in going forward with. But if it is uh, something that's misreading on my part, I feel a little uncomfortable with this and this. Like, I don't want to hold your hand when we're drinking if we're not going to be together. And I'd prefer if we sit on different couches if we're watching a movie together, because that feels like something that is a little too intimate for us just being roommates. Yeah. And that's a boring answer. Like, I no, know it's, it's not. that people want there to be this like spark and this chemistry, and, and then it bursts into flame with passion. But these are the kinds of things that you have to deal with in a relationship where you have those conversations and you talk about your boundaries and your expectations and your wants and desires. And you need to be able to do that to start the relationship as well, I think. Yeah. And I have just realized that you didn't actually ask me for my opinion on this whole thing. And I've just given it for the last couple of minutes. So I hope that was the intention of yeah. this segment. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've literally been giving you just a lead. And I like I love it, Stratton, because I don't even have to be like, what are your thoughts, good sir? You're just like, I'm like, hey, here's the, here's, here's the little... Because it's like, I was like, oh, so you lived in Australia. And you're like, well, actually, and then you told the story. And you told exactly what I wanted to hear. So I just, I give you a little touch, and then you do the rest. So thank you. 
Well, um, if I'm overstepping myself, please do let me know, because I apologize. No, sir. No, you, you are absolutely 100% fine. Um, I See, I like your I like your thought style. I've had that blow up in my face in the past before, though. Interesting. Where I'm like, look, huh. And I was just like, I, like, look, this is what I see. This And a lot of times the girls are like, just shut up and kiss me. Like, you're overthinking. It's like, that's okay. That's fair. Yeah, got you. Got you. Not ruin the moment. Good. Um... I, I see. I'm making two assumptions here. Assumption number one is like I have a big ass couch. You know, I the all the good shit hit earlier in the year because of the pandemic. I was like, all right, let's upgrade the apartment. So I got myself a fat, a big old couch here. I like. I feel like if I swear around you, like it's just it's super impolite and it's just it's it's rednecky and I don't. Uh, it's just you're so. <laughs> okay, rigid. well, uh, let's get this out of the way. Fuck shit, cunt. Uh, there we bitch. go. He said it. He said the sewer. Okay. I, I am aware of those words as concepts, even if I don't use them in everyday conversation, so please, feel free. Oh, uh, you're so dirty. The C word is so taboo here. Whatever. Okay, so I got a big-ass fucking couch, and, um, like, like I can legitimately fit three people on it, and we'd, we'd still have space in between. So I'm making one assumption that they are probably either broke college students, or they are, like, brand new on their own, and they have probably just a, uh, oh, what is that called? A love seat. They probably just have a love seat. Now, when you're cuddling next to each other, like, I've cuddled next to uh, plenty of dudes and plenty of women on C-130s when I flew around in the Air Force. I mean, one of my jobs was to be an air marshal on a C-130, and I have cuddled with more men than I care to admit. Because, you know, like, you get on that plane, and that plane is just, that you can fit 105 people on there, they squeeze out 110 just to get you from A to B. Uh, you know, they're like, all right, we're going to load it up, let's go. And it's like, all right. So when someone sits that close to me, especially, like, in a love seat, kind of understand that uh the hand holding when you're drunk you're 100 percent correct on that uh, a lot of people get real touchy real feely um what i might do is i might try to m hold their hand while you're sober you know see what the gauge the reaction from that is um and i like what you said about consent consent because i've heard i hear this all the time consent is sexy well here's the thing you know, do that movie cliche thing where you kind of touch her touch her by the cheek and move her over and just be like I'm getting the vibe that 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 you know that you want to kiss or something a little further with this, and then that's kind of your open door to see where it goes. But you're right; if it blows up in your face, whoo boy, sitting on that love seat for some movies in the future is going to be real awkward. <laughs> yeah, I think your your point about consent is uh, is a really important one. That like there are levels of consent and levels of communication that mm -hmm. are still effective and real communication. So uh, taking this person's face in your uh, hand and, and moving yourself closer to them is asking for consent. Mm -hmm. You're not taking anything. You're not stealing anything. You're not forcing anything. You're, you are making the next move and allowing them to move away if they don't feel comfortable or to, to, address that further and you can say that kind of thing with like there's a line that i have heard a couple of times but i have never had reason to put it into practice but i really like which is i'd really like to kiss you now yeah perfect and i love it i think it's such a great line because it expresses your intentions but allows for enthusiastic consent or disconsent yeah where someone can make the opposite move and say i'm really not comfortable with that um in a moment where it is appropriate like you're not going to walk up to them in the kitchen and say <laughs> oi you <laughs> woman uh, give me a kiss now exactly yeah <laughs> but the context is so important with this kind of thing and you're uh, totally right i didn't say this before but i think it's a really good point that you've made that it doesn't have to be uh like yes or no it or black and white it can be this is the situation and this is what is appropriate for the situation yeah. without breaking the mood or breaking the moment there are varying degrees of of what is comfortable for both of you to move in either direction and you just need to make sure that you're leaving an avenue for someone to move in the opposite direction if they don't feel comfortable uh, i think it was the movie hitch believe it or not a will smith movie that i'm referencing here um, yes, I do watch love, uh, love romance movies. Uh, it was one of the very few that I ended up watching. But Hitch had a really, uh, a really cool concept that I actually kind of took to heart, which is weird. 
Um, he, I think it was the 90% rule where you as the male go 90% of the way and then you let her come the other 10%, you know, for the kiss. You don't just move straight into the kiss. I would prefer more of a 75 to 25%, you know, mm-hmm. give her a little bit more room. And uh, I found that works out either very well and uh, if uh, it works out very well either way. You know, in a denial where, I, you know, I just move a little bit closer, show that little bit of intent and stop and let her come the other way. It, uh, you know, it's really nice. But look at us being feminists. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. But, yeah. So I, I like I, I, I like your way because it's very uh, it's very structured. Um, but, yeah, like, dude, be ready, like, for this shit to blow up in your face if it if if it goes backwards, because. You're going to have some very awkward moments, especially if it is that love ca- love seat, you know. Watch yeah, it. wait till the lease is about to expire. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, so this one is a little interesting just because I, I find it super, super fascinating. Uh, I'm a male who is 13 years old. I might be trans. Any help? Uh, this this very young gentleman here asks, uh, or, or, or female, or whatever he wants to be, f- sorry, um, so I have uh, had gender dysphoria like since March. Uh, forgot, but still. So there's reasons I think I'm trans. Uh, number one, I like girls' clothing more than I like boys, which is pretty simple. I like the idea of being a girl more than a boy. Uh, I like being a boy about ten percent, and other stuff that's minor. Any help in this? So this this very young individual, I should say. I apologize. This young individual thinks that may they may be wanting to uh, flip flop. So, if you want to take the lead, go for it, or I can jump the gun here. Man, I, this is such um, a great moment in this person's life for them to be thinking about their identity, right? I think yeah. we all go through something like this in high school, in our teenage years, where we're trying to figure out who we are. And for many of us, that is a much more... Uh, straightforward question than what is my gender, right? Like we mm-hmm. we are far more comfortable in that basic element of selfhood than it seems like this person is. And and many trans or non-binary youths go through uh, a a moment in their lives that is far more difficult than I think we have ever had to go through in terms of our self-identifying and and. Uh, soul searching as adolescents so i just want to um recognize that up front that like this is in some senses above my pay grade as someone who <laughs> has has never had to face that kind of uh base level reevaluation of themselves as a human being like that is a huge thing to have to go through and there's no way that it is going to be an easy discussion to have with anyone or or even with yourself um so to this young person i i uh, i empathize with you greatly um but i think that what is necessary is that they have the opportunity to to be themselves whatever that might mean in a safe space and in a safe way um, and for many people, unfortunately, they don't have the opportunity in their home life to feel like they are safe and accepted, whatever that might mean, whether it's mm-hmm. that their uh, sexuality is contrary to what is perceived as the norm or that they have um, thoughts about their gender identity that might be incompatible with the, the beliefs of those around them. So being safe in the way that you express yourself is has to be number one but the exploration of that is also super important like uh, disregarding that exploration and your lived experience as someone who is questioning your gender identity is uh really harmful and i think that it, it becomes something that is um a a bugbear later in life that sort of like itches at you on the inside, right? That you didn't have the opportunity to be yourself for so many years and you're now having to have those difficult conversations and um, and try and reevaluate your own self-image in light of something that could have been 
not taken care of, but at least addressed much earlier. Yeah. So I think that's the balancing act for this young person is is how do you make sure that you are not putting yourself in a situation that might be dangerous? Um, unfortunately, there are many people in this world who are so uh, unwilling to accept that there are people outside the binary, um, both in terms of gender and sexuality, that they uh, might do harm to such a person who expresses those views. and. Uh, while I want to say, yes, live your truth, be yourself, wear whatever you want, do whatever you want, your life is the most important thing. And if you are worried that the people around you are going to do physical or emotional harm to you, uh, you really need to be careful about that. And so finding a safe space, finding people who care about you and are willing to accept you, no matter what that means, is going to be your first priority before you think about exploring at least outwardly these mm -hmm. dynamics and and this aspect of your true self whatever that might mean whether you are trans or whether this is something that you want to explore and and move into a more non-binary uh, phase of your existence so <laughs> good luck <laughs> you know it, it's it's kind of funny because i wear a kilt from time to time, I served with a bunch of Scots. I thought it would be super cool to get a kilt. I got a kilt, love it. Um, you know, first question is always, are you Scottish? Nope, German, Swedish, <laughs> and Polish. And then like, why do you wear a kilt? I was like, cause it's awesome. I love it, it's great. Um, my advice is a little bit different. Um, there are gonna be people that are gonna hate on you no matter what you do, no matter how much you, uh, you conform to society or no matter what you say or do. Uh, finding that safe space is paramount because you do need to return to a safe environment at the end of the day. Um, you know, my safe environment is right here that, you know, you know, if, if you're pissing me off, just boop, press the button, you're done. All right. Bye Stratton. <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's, it's nice to have that environment to where you can come in and, and decompress. Uh, I would say either hold tight for a couple of years. Um, the only reason why I say hold tight for a couple of years is because you're 13 I don't, I'm 34, big guy. I don't even know what I want to do. Like, I'm still finding myself. You know what I mean? Like, I'm still figuring out who the devil I am. Uh, and I, I don't know how you, old you are, Stratton, but, you know, how many times have you come across something where you're just like, oh, this is a new thing I learned about myself, you know? So it, it definitely, I would say, hold off on just a little while longer. Um, not because of, I think you're too young, but give some time some thought. It's a lot like a tattoo. You don't just randomly get something tattooed on you because you're like, oh, that looks dope. You're like, I've liked that for a set amount of time. I think it would be really good. The thought, it, you know, everything works out. Everything plays well. And then do, uh, I guess it's probably the worst phrasing I give, but go balls to the fucking wall with it, you know? <laughs> wear that dress. Wear that tube top. Wear that crop top. I don't care what you do. You be you, homeboy. Or, or home girl, Or home whatever you want to be. Because it's important to, exp if you're not expressing yourself the way you want to be, I know that can be a mental issue as well too. That can cause mental harm uh, because you can't outwardly just be like, I'm here, uh, you know, the famous saying, I'm here, I'm queer, fucking deal with it, you know? I think it'd be great, you know, if, you, if it is something that you want to do, but remember to think long and hard and then when you do ball out and go for it, see how much you like it. Um, one thing is be careful. Uh, there's a joke that a comedian by the name of Rodney Carrington made about how he met a gay guy at a bar and the gay guy told him, you know, oh, you should try dick once. You don't just try something that extreme once because if you go to that extreme and you don't like it, it could be a detriment to you because of whatever happens around you. So you're right, Stratton. Finding that very safe environment to do all that fun stuff is, but once you find that safe environment, go for it. Just be the, be the most you that you can be, hoss sauce and and figure out if you like wearing those skirts, you know, get a padded bra. See if you like having, you know, the, the women parts. And if, if you like it enough, man, get on the knife and go for it. Be the best you that you can be. As long as you're happy, that's all that matters. Yeah, I think that's uh, great advice. The only reason why I, um, I hadn't advocated uh, waiting a certain amount of time is that I know that 
and I'm speaking as someone who is not a member of the trans community, but considers himself an ally. So I apologize if any of the information that I'm about to state is incorrect. But I know that medical transition and hormonal therapy becomes a different ball game once you have progressed through mm. your natural puberty. Mm. So if you're seriously considering whether you might be trans, there are options in terms of hormone blockers and other things that might halt the natural puberty processes that you might want to investigate. Yeah. And I know that going off of those has some side effects, but can it is a process that is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, considered reversible, and you can then continue along with puberty and with your life of your gender assigned at birth if you wish to, uh, but can instead go with hormone replacement if that is something that you feel is more true to who you, who you are. So definitely be sure of your decision, whatever that might mean, and wait as long as you need to. Um, but I don't know that as someone who is uh, 30 plus now, I, the reason why <laughs> I said I don't live closeted for so long is because there are physical and biological ramifications to that choice if you're um, if you're hiding something that you feel you might regret. So just having that safe space to talk with other people about your experiences and, and your feelings so that you can come to that informed decision um, in a way that is safe and is, uh, is as advantageous to whatever your decision might be as soon as possible is, is, um, is not a bad thing to be thinking yeah. about. The, the only problem that, uh, the only reason why I say wait is obviously because, you know, at the age of 13, how many of us really don't know what we're doing in life and, and what's going on? And I know that it is very critical to, uh, when, when transitioning to be able to transition early. And I, I, I know stats can be construed. I don't know how much it is true, but you always hear about the, oh, I, I transitioned and I regret it and I wish I could go back. And, you know, you just, you hear, you hear these great love stories, you know, where somebody blossomed into exactly who they wanted to become and then you also hear the dark stories and i you know i with me i'm so i'm so rapid with stuff i'm like i like it i've got it let's you know click clack go that's how i operate sometimes and sometimes i i come to regret things very very you know very <laughs> there's a lot of regret um uh, but yeah no i i like whatever's appropriate for you you know uh, if it's if it's what Stratton's saying, if it's what I'm saying, or if it's somewhere in the middle, because Stratton is Stratton, Jared is Jared, you're you. You know you even at 13, I think you know yourself more than any anything. Um, but like, yeah, it's it's so hard. It's so hard because you 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 can only go off of your life experiences and go. This is what I know from what I got. So that that was that was dope. Uh, got anything else to add there, big guy? Just uh, to that person. Good luck. Yeah. Sorry, you you were staring like you were you, you like you were waiting for me to finish, and I was no, no, not at idiot, all. So. I um, I th I thought that your point about um people regretting their medical transitions was a, a an interesting one, and I have heard stories like that as well. I was just thinking that I have also heard stories where people have known since uh, I think the average age is about six, where people realize that something is wrong with their gender. Really? Six. Um. That's that's my understanding. And again, I am a cis, straight, white guy. Do not listen to me. <laughs> Do your own research, please, for the love of God. I am I'm doing my best to remain informed and be the best advocate that I can. But I have not lived through this experience and, and um, it has not figured in my life in the same way that it might do for someone who has lived it. So yeah, that is my, my understanding is that um, these feelings of gender dysphoria can begin as early as that. So oh, okay. it's it's one of those things that is just hardwired into those people who experience it, and and we really need to be willing to listen to their experiences when they uh, advocate for themselves. I didn't know it could be as early as six. That that was I just I didn't I've never really done a whole lot of research. I just listened to Joe Rogan. I know he's probably the worst to get a lot of that information from, but you know you you hear these stories and it's just like like okay, how young does somebody really know? And if you're telling me you've heard it, a lot of people around six ish can kind of really realize it. That's, that's pretty impressive. Like that, like, cause I, I know that, you know, 
when I think of a child, I don't I don't think of a child as being cognitively aware of anything or until they're like 14 or 15. But that's probably because of the way I was raised and the way I remember myself. So, you know, but that's I'd never heard that before. That's that's new information, dude. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. Yeah, my uh, my pleasure. Again, I um I don't come with stats, unfortunately. I, I just come with my lived experience and, and what I've read. So, I'm not I'm not going to ask you to cite anything. If you if you think you heard it, it might be true. Hey, somebody's got you know. If people want to want to Google it after this, they, you got Google right along with you. you. The vast majority of people who are listening are listening at their desk right now, working on a computer. So they have a tab that they can open to Google if they really want to do the research. Other than that, just listen to us speak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so this uh, this this person uh, th this I okay this this father says my son who is nineteen is refusing to get the COVID vaccine. Is he being selfish? Uh, my wife and I have both gotten her. Okay, so I shouldn't assume that this is a husband. So my wife and I have both gotten her the COVID jab. We are both hitting fifty and think it's a sensible thing to do. My son, however, thinks the jab is dangerous, unnecessary, and he adamantly is refusing it. Uh, me and the wife have uh, tried convincing him dozens of times to get the vaccine, but I would, I would I would let it be. But my mother, who is 82, lives with us, and she's vulnerable, though she is fully vaccined. Uh, I think he's being selfish. Is he being selfish? I paraphrased a little bit there, but that that's about the gist of it. Oh boy, uh, that is a. If you want to think on it, I I I I've I've gone through these in my head. Well, well, I, I'd love to hear your take as I sort of formulate my own thoughts. So your, your son is now 19. If he is doing something you don't like, give him a swift kick in the ass and send him right out the door. Tell him to get an apartment. Hell, get, get him a down payment on an apartment. He is now officially an adult. He does not live under your house. There, uh, he lives under your house, so therefore he has to abide by your rules. Um, I'm a big advocate of, of if... If you're an adult in a situation where you are in charge of a minor, at a certain point, you have authority, you know, where if it's like, uh, you know, Timmy or Tommy doesn't want to eat all the mac and cheese or they don't like what you made for dinner, go make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or you go hungry for the night. You know, that's what I made. As a child, I, I think children need to be structured because of the chaotic nature that they are. Uh, you know, not so much structured where you're helicoptering over them, you know, figuring out every decision, but they live under your house, they live under your rules, especially as an adult, they now can make decisions for themselves. If they're an adult and they don't want to abide by the rules in your household, deuces, bro, maybe being very selfish. Uh, he may have done his research, and I, I use air quotes because you never know what kind of research somebody may have done, whether it be legitimate or whether it be uh, Facebook research. You know, Facebook research can be true, but there's limits, you know, as well as we've noticed that some scientific articles can be faked because of an individual in the background, but that's a whole nother discussion. He's a grown adult. You are grown adults too. He's living under your household. You have every right to go, hey, you got, you got a decision. Either get stabbed or get... I was trying to make a pun there, but it didn't work. But you know what I'm trying to say. You know, either get the get the jab or get right out of the house. So that's I, I he may be being selfish, yes, but you have an opportunity to be an adult in this situation. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I think um you you make a really elegant suggestion to this poster. <laughs> Uh, at which, uh, like, my, all of my thoughts were about, okay, how do you convince this person that science, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I have learned through my own lived experience. My sister refuses to get the vaccine, and she um, believes that it will poison her, and it will uh, be deleterious to her health in the future. And we have just, as a family, reached the point where we're like, okay, look. You can live your life, but if you want to do these things with us, then you have to have a vaccine because mm -hmm. our parents are in our six, their 60s. And even though they're vaccinated, we're not willing to put up with the possibility that you might not be safe around them. Yeah. And it sounds like that is exactly the situation that this poster is in as well. And you're absolutely right, Jared. This son is an adult and he can make his own decisions legally. And if he wants to not get vaccinated, that is his right. But it is also a grave and present danger to 
this poster's mother, who is living with them and is uh, has a damaged immune system uh, from being in a sensitive age bracket. And even with full vaccination, breakthrough cases do happen and they can be dangerous. Um, and it is necessary that she be allowed to live as safely as possible. And if the son being at home no longer presents a safe home environment for the mother, one of these things has to change. And the adult who is making the decision to put others at risk is the one who needs to be making the change. Also, I need to have a conversation with Bill Gates because of, supposedly the vaccine is supposed to give me 5G and I still have garbage signal in my house. So Bill Gates, if you are listening, which I highly doubt, or somebody who knows Bill Gates can get in touch with him, I need that 5G chip updated that I got, you know, dosed with. So just saying. Man, here I've been standing under 5G towers so that I could get COVID superpowers and yeah. nothing's happened. <laughs> this whole thing has been a clusterfuck. I was hoping to become Homelander, or at least Spider-Man. You know, <laughs> come on, guys. Uh, so speaking of Homelander and Spider-Man, um, this uh, this this individual here, Common Shame, which is a glorious name, says, I need advice for a school fight. So at my middle school, there's a kid who is taller and stronger than me, always hitting me, punching me, and even choking me. I've been thinking of fighting back since the teachers do nothing about it, so what should I do? Sorry for bad English. So, um, I don't know where they are, but yeah. Uh, school advice fight. Ah, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this, because I've been in one fight in my entire life. Um, but I have heard a lot of stories about the school system, at least here in the United States, and their zero tolerance policy is uh, selective, mm. shall we say, in terms of bullying and um, the consequences thereof. I have heard a lot of stories about people who stood up to their bully and then got punished because it is easier to punish the good kid than to punish the person who, who acts out and who may have parents who are also difficult to deal with maybe hence why the bullying is happening in the first place so i hesitate to say just sock them one in the face or go straight for the nads um which is the advice that i would like to give to someone who is experiencing something where there is no other recourse for them um it's a tough situation uh yeah um i'm the opposite Kick him in the dick. Just come up from behind him, wind straight the fuck up like a soccer kick, and drop him. There's uh, I, there, there's, there's two reasons why I say this. Reason number one, uh, my dad always told me, eh, don't start the fight, but you better damn well finish it. No, I can respect that. And number two, I remember an ex girl from ex girlfriend of mine was having issues with a with a boy fr with a male friend of hers. Um, that was doing some shenanigans uh, in, in, in high school. And she told me about how she was getting sick of him. I kept advising her what to do. And then finally I go, look, Christina, raise that knee up, bring him in real close and just drop him. Guaranteed, no more issues. That is the one thing that, I'll get a st that will stop a man from doing very much now and in the future. Well, guess what she finally did? She raised that knee up, brought him to the ground, no more issues. Hell, he didn't even bother her, let alone talk with her. Was very shy around her for the future. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my my two cents. Um, uh, yeah, I think unfortunately, I think that is the correct answer in this case because <laughs> uh, in many instances, uh, people who are bullies are looking for easy targets. And if you no longer present yourself as an easy target, if you are willing to fight back and um, to do as much damage as you get, then you are no longer someone who is an attractive option for them if they are looking for that rush of adrenaline that it, that comes with, uh, with those activities. So unfortunately, I think that there may be consequences to that. My answer before was sort of based on experiences where standing up to bullying means that in the eyes of the school or in the eyes of administration, parents, etc., you are no better than that person and you are treated as though you are also a bully, which 
sucks. That's not the yeah. way that life should be. Yeah. That's not the way that these people in authority should be responding to this problem in the first place. But it's easier for them to stop the troublemaker if you're the one who's bringing up the issue that this person is bullying me and I stood up for <laughs> myself. Uh, and that meant that his awful parents are now going to be complaining. I don't mean to be assuming genders about uh, who is involved in the story. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's two men. Two men. Okay. But um, then these parents descend on the school and say, my beautiful Timmy was destroyed by this young whippersnapper over here. And he didn't do anything wrong. He's a perfect golden boy. Uh, and that just causes more parents, more problems for the administration. Uh and the fact that that could happen is awful. Like, I hate that people are willing to go through the path of least resistance and just blame the child, but it does happen. So if this person goes through with, I guess, what is our advice, because I, I am also <laughs> <laughs> a lot of advocating that you don't put up with this anymore, you just need to be prepared for those, uh, the ramifications of those actions, uh, as shitty as they may be. Yeah. Also, send me your address. I'll send you a coupon to a local ice cream shop when you're on, you know, when you're on out, out of school <laughs> suspension. That's fine. And that's that's definitely what I do. Oh, you got in school suspended for kicking your bowl in the dick. Great. Let's take you out for ice cream, big guy. That's what I'd do. Uh, all right. Uh, next one here because it's fun. Oh no, I did not want to join that. Please don't. I hate that. Uh, the our advice section is a cesspool that I wade through to get these good questions. Um, Ooh. I, I do not want to be a part of that group. That there are some questions. I, I think I, I think I talk about this with everybody. So Lindsay might even know, but it's just like, it's like this girl made out with me, told me she loved me. Should I ask her on a date? And it's like, what do you fucking think, dude? Like, seriously, really? You, you like, if you got hit in the face with a brick, would you know it was a brick that hit you in the face? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Uh, so this, uh, embarrassed duck one asks is there any any way to reason with somebody who has fringe relig religious beliefs and severe anxiety to take the covid vaccine there is i you probably can't oh that's right because you're at that camera you probably can't see it but there's a wall of text that i don't want to read um but basically what it it, it blames it, it throws down to is this person has those quote unquote um fringe religious beliefs that are a little bit out there you know they're a little bit more than the norm they may not be uh they may be like a sect of christianity that may not be known or, or that much and they're also very anxious about the vaccine i'm not sure if it what it really talked about with the anxiety um i think it's more of just like uh the pandemic you know fear of going out fear of going into the world uh, was maybe heightened because of the vaccine it, it didn't really make too much sense but yeah so what would you be advice for the individual who wants to convince someone to get the COVID vaccine when they have fringe religious beliefs and severe anxiety? Um, oh boy, another, <laughs> you're not coming in with easy questions, are you? Why, why, uh, why would I throw you a softball, Stratton? I didn't throw Lindsay enough. a softball. I, I don't throw softballs, my man. I don't. Uh, 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 man, this is a, a tricky question and it requires, I think, an understanding of this individual that we as outsiders don't really possess mm -hmm. because um, what you're really asking is what line of questioning will work and we don't know enough about this person to say whether they have family that might be in you immunocompromised or they might have beliefs about science in other aspects of their life that might make them uh, open to a discussion about like the nature of scientific thought in the first place. Um, and this is unfortunately living in Texas, uh, another thing that I have experienced in my own life where like I know some people who have uh, religious beliefs that are, um, hmm, I guess, fundamentalist in some respect. Uh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I'd like they, I'd, I'd when it's someone someone's like left wing or right wing or fundamentalist or this or that I'm like I, I heard Christianity I know what that is mm -hmm. so yeah sorry I just wanted to interrupt no there. no I look unfortunately all of these terms are slightly nebulous because they apply to swaths of the population that uh, that all have slightly different ideas and we're all individuals what is so nebulous? whenever we categorize people it is uh, 
inaccurate to say the least. Okay, is that um, what nebulous is? I don't I don't know what nebulous is. Yeah, so um, nebulous means uh, something that is um, murky or uh, not necessarily inaccurate, but not giving a full view of of what we're seeing. This is really dangerous because I'm learning new things that I want to use in phone conversations that I have with my sales, and I don't know <laughs> if it's going to work. I apologize. I, I'm sorry. I, like, I know I can sit over here and Google, but I... I'd rather be invested in, in the story, and sometimes hearing it from somebody else helps make it stick. So, I okay, continue. My apologies. Uh, no, no worries at all. Um, so, I guess my point is that the the conversations that I have had in my own life with people who share different religious beliefs, in this case, it is a, a sect of Christianity that uh, lies... Um, on the more science denialism end of the spectrum, uh, were about like what we know about the universe in general and the fundamental laws of biology and physics. And like, if we agree that bacteria are real and viruses are real and this and that, then is it possible, is it conceivable that we move forward in that direction in terms of a line of questioning? and there is an old um, style of conversation uh, used a lot in philosophy, and it's named for a philosopher called the Socratic method, where you uh, it's an argument through questioning, where you're not presenting your own thoughts necessarily, except you are, because the way that you ask questions demonstrates the line of thought you want another person to go down. So when you engage in the Socratic method, uh, it's possible for it to be um, bad faith arguments. We hear online about something called sea lioning, which is uh, named after the way that sea lions like jump in and out of the water. And that's when people like pop up and they have a question that's a totally legitimate question, except for the fact that it's impossible to answer within the scope of a conversation. And then they disappear again and then they wait and then they come back up again and they say, oh, how about this other thing that's totally impossible to answer within the context of a conversation and also is a very nebulous scientific topic on the fringe edges of what we're talking about in the first place. And then they dip back uh, and it's a way to sow doubt in an argument. What I'm talking about in terms of the Socratic method is to to engage with the person that you're talking to in a way that is um, genuine and not only genuine, but genuinely empathetic and and willing to be wrong if the questions that you ask have a different answer than you expect but you're still able to ask questions that get the other person to think about the topic in a larger sense. So this person in whatever fringe religious movement they are in may have heard things about, we were joking about 5G earlier, but <laughs> the, the fact that that's a legitimate theory that people have put forward, uh, legitimate used very heavily in air quotes there, is mind boggling. <laughs> but people believe these things because they're told them by authority figures. Yeah. And the church presents a huge authority figure in people's lives. Yeah. So being willing to listen to your church oftentimes means that you're being fed things that you don't feel the need to question yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you have someone else who is willing to ask those questions and has a friendly uh, disposition towards you and is willing to engage with you honestly and intellectually, isn't trying to get one up on you, but just wants you to think through these decisions that you've already made, it can be a really effective way to talk to people and to get them to think about their own positions in a more open-minded way. Um, so I think that is maybe the only thing that comes to mind for me about how to convince someone like this of something that might be so ingrained in their sense of self as in their religious teachings. Um, everything you just said, just ditto. Um, I had this beautiful little, uh, I guess you would call it a diatribe about uh, the backfire effect, which I'm not sure you have heard of. 
Um, hmm. Okay, so this is a, this is something that's super popular. It's called the backfire effect and why facts don't always change minds. Um, essentially, what it boils down to, the very TLDR of the backfire effect is that you can throw facts at somebody or you could discuss some, with somebody uh, with things that are so factually based that it's impossible to deny these facts that they they are in the headspace that they basically refuse to accept said facts mm. and they just start digging that trench a little bit deeper and they they you know they get more stubborn about it because that's the way they are and that's one of the problems that i, I fear a lot of the times with something as as i don't want to say controversial but as large as covid or as large as the catholic church and the priests and all the other fun little naughty things that have happened throughout society and, and the years that, you know, you could be so staunchly a, for or against something that you hit them with that and all of a sudden they try to clear from the backblast and it's just garbage, you know, pure garbage. So, yeah, uh, that's that's the only thing that I, I fear out of that just simply because you never know when somebody is going to, you know, throw the, the backfire effect at you and you're just like, okay. You know, that's that's it. That's all I got. So that's the only thing I fear. Yeah, we we hear uh, sometimes, um, I guess it's a meme, really, about being blinded by science. Yeah. And people are, are, are oftentimes not particularly science literate. And any amount of science is enough to blind them and make them turn away from that science in a way that is not constructive and does not help with building a rapport uh, to try and get them out of whatever cognitive dissonance they might be feeling when they're presented with an argument that's inconsistent with their worldviews. So yeah. yeah, great point. Uh, that's a term I haven't heard before, the backfire effect. I, I didn't know what it was until my buddy Alex actually introduced it to me, like I think a season and a half ago. Uh, I'm sorry, talking about the podcast, like about a year and a half ago, we, we, had, that, we had a conversation and he's like, oh yeah, this is backfire effect. I was like, what? And so, yeah. All right. I, I know this podcast is going on a little long here. It's, it's it's one of the other longer episodes that I have. I think it's just because you're so awesome to talk to. So thank you. I've got one final question here, and then sure. we're gonna we're gonna cut it off at at the head because uh, it is a Tuesday night uh, of all things. So this individual, uh, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. Said, should I marry my brother's widow? I come from a society that observes polygamy. Three years ago, my elder brother died in an account. In an account leaving behind his wife and seven-year-old kid, my sister-in-law and I have been close ever since. I took the responsibility for the child, and due to her son, uh, due to her son who lives with me for the past year, the two of us have been sharing certain moments. A few of them in the intimate nature or sexual nature. I am supposed to get married to a girl next year. However, me and my sister-in-law also want to get married. She is four four years older than I am. When I spoke to my family about this, they were against it. However, my fiance supports the decision of mine. So should I marry my brother's widow? Oh, boy. Uh, that is another uh, question which culturally I do not feel like I am quite equipped <laughs> to answer categorically. It sounds from the question asker's perspective uh, that they are in a culture that practices polygamy and it also sounds like the fiance is okay with this situation that is something that i have not had any experience with um and so i think that is going to be the most difficult thing to navigate whether this poster feels like they have a responsibility to the widow or romantic feelings towards her as well as to his fiance. Yeah. If you can make it work, but uh, I think relationships are tricky enough as it is. Yeah. Um, oh God. Uh, un momento, por favor. There we go. Cool. I stalled for long enough. Um, I've been neglecting the uh, the lady who's supposed to be coming over on Saturday. So I apologize. I was hoping you would go on another beautiful rant about oh, something. Oh, sorry. And I, I should no, have kept no. going. I was hoping to hear what your thoughts were. Uh, number one, uh, whether you're polygamous or not, um, you've obviously been sharing moments that uh, connect with you. 
Is there a reality that it could be very detrimental? Yes. Um, she may be dating you because you are his brother and she may feel that, uh, that subconscious connection with you. It could be, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word toxic here. Um, maybe you can think of a better word there, Stratton, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that it just could be detrimental just because of the, the way that the, the relationship dynamic is, was conceived. But you're 100 percent correct. If if it's um, if it's both consensual, she's in it for. If she's not in it for the gold, like a gold digger, I would say rock and roll it. Especially if your fiance is supportive of you, that would tell me that other people are supportive. And if she's okay with polygamy, I mean, if if ever, if all the boxes are checked, live your best life. See what happens. Maybe it does grow to be toxic because of what I just said. Maybe it it, it grows to be awesome, and all of a sudden you're a thruple or a quintuple or an octuple whatever whatever you are as long as everyone is happy and checks the boxes and says this is okay fuck it go for it that's that's my two cents um i've been in relationships where people have said no bueno uh sorry i'll finish up here real quick i know you got something to say uh i've been in relationships where people say no bueno fuck them you know as long as you're happy great and then let them have the i told you so in the end so there we go definitely i think that your this person's parents are potentially the culture in which this person is residing means that their parents are an important part of their social circle and life they may even be living with them depending upon which culture it might be uh so take that with a grain of salt in terms of totally disregarding their beliefs but the most important people in this scenario are you and these two women uh, except for one other person who I didn't mention earlier, but while you were speaking, Jared, is super important to talk about, and that's the son of yeah. your brother. Uh, I I think did you say that he was seven I at the think, time? Let me let me double check here real quick. Yeah, because... I probably should have mentioned uh, the the kid part because you're right. That does bring up something very very important. Um, let's see here. In, uh, yeah, I love it. This, this, podcast in real time uh well, well i'll vamp while you look um, go for it i think that no matter the age of this uh, this kid it's very possible that he has memories uh of his father and uh a, a relationship with the person that his father was or who he believed him to be and the idea of you replacing his father in a very literal sense as his uncle seven yep um, it could be really detrimental to his development emotionally. Um, and that is a hard thing for someone to go through where you feel like someone very important in your life who was there for you and, and was present until they suddenly weren't is replaced rather than being honored and uh remembered in a way that you feel like they should be so that i think is something that really needs to be taken into consideration is is the way in which this poster's nephew feels about the idea of someone else entering into his mother's life and we uh, there's a lot of complex feelings around the idea of single women with children dating again after a partner dies and they definitely deserve happiness but they are no longer individuals they are part of a family mm -hmm. and who enters that family i think is is an important consideration for the members of the family as well as just for whoever is going to be the romantic partner yeah uh you bring up an excellent point because when I was, uh, I think it was when I was twelve or thirteen, my mom uh, and my dad did a did a did get divorced, and when my stepdad came to the picture, uh, like I was fine with my stepdad up until the point that they were talking about marriage, and then I guess something inside of me clicked, and I was just like, "Fuck that guy," you know, and then. We ended up having a really big fight, and next thing I know is that, you know, now I've got two dads in my life. You know, I respect my father as well as I respect my stepfather. You know, they've my stepdad has taught me things that my dad could not teach me because they come from two different walks of life, and it it, it can be very challenging. Um, you know, the, the, the way you were talking about convincing someone before, maybe take that and kind of figure out how the child would feel about that. And if they're like, no, that's right, you know, maybe kind of go, 
oh, mommy and, you know, mommy's moving in here because it'd be a little bit easier financially and just not bring up the fact that they're, they're now husband and wife. I mean, yeah, it sucks to kind of like hide those feelings, but, you know, you're right. You are a single mom. You you have to take into consideration that you, you are now uh, two individuals and not just one. So I don't feel qualified enough to answer the rest of that. I don't. I don't. I, I'm a. I'm a. a, a sing, uh, I'm a single male, and my only, my only dependents are a son, Conyer, and a blue monk parrot that are so self self sufficient that if I had, if I had a, a a machine that could clean and keep their water dish clean and sterile, I wouldn't have to do things for at least five or six days with them, other than just interact with them every morning. So, just you know, like yeah, that's how un parenting i am in things so yeah that's how unqualified i am so did you have anything else to add stratton or no i think um the only other thing is that i think both of us are from cultures where the concept of polygamy is generally considered to be fringe in some respect like i personally was not brought up in a environment that um, normalized that and it doesn't mean that it is something that I find to be um, problematic or uh, it's it's different and so yeah society looks at it, it it should be viewed upon as something different yes but not a bad different you know totally and, and I guess my only point is that as a result I don't have enough context for how those relationships work. That is not the way that I am personally wired to give any advice to this person about managing the potential for a polygamous relationship. Um, so we've touched a little bit on, on whether the idea of marrying your brother's former spouse is problematic and what that means in terms of your family structure and the child but in terms of how the relationship dynamic works between you and your fiance and uh, your brother's widow that is something that I do not feel in any way qualified to really comment on um, and I think that if it's something that is pre more present in your culture then you would know better than we would how to navigate such a situation yeah. i've uh i've dabbled in polygamy slightly mm -hmm. i've dabbled in it i, I don't want to say that i've i've attempted to do anything i, I think i've uh, dipped a toe in it uh, uh for a relationship that i had and uh i can tell you that uh from what i've read online as well as a lot of things that i've seen online and the little bit of interaction that i've had there is a right way a wrong way some people are built for it some people are built for different things and being polyg being a polygamist or being po I should just say being poly in and of itself is so individualized down to the person that uh you know I I've seen it on the poly because uh, I've gone to op our polyamorous which I feel is very toxic because a lot of people project their own ideas and beliefs onto other people um because like you can you can mention something and it'll have 30 or 40 different comments and you will legitimately have 30 to 40 different ways to view something you know, it's, it's very crazy. So when it comes to polygamy, I would highly uh, encourage somebody to just kind of, you know, intrapersonally look into yourself, figure out how you feel it is versus somebody else. Because, man, if you wanted to talk about some snowflakes yet, and, and it's not a, it's not a derogatory term there. It is just that each individual is so unique with their individuality, with the way that they view being polyamorous. It is so hard to just kind of be like, this is a code. This is how you live by it. Here's part three. You just, you can't because what somebody else wants out of a polyamorous relationship is totally like, it's just, you got to find the right cogs to put the, the pieces in it. It just, it's so hard in today's society sometimes, but yeah, you're, you're right. Um, polygamy is new. It's, it's, it, well, it's new in society is being accepted, but Man, it's hard to find a, uh, another snowflake that's just about what you look like out there in society with with everybody being so free and open. And I'm not saying that is a bad thing. I'm just saying when you try to match up the same individuals for the same mindsets, it's, it's fucking hard. Mm. So, anywho, 
Uh, so, Strand, I heard you do some ASMR stuff on Twitch. Do you want to... You want to go ahead and uh, send that out into the world and, 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 and yeah, tell us where we sure. can find you? Uh, I, I was not expecting the opportunity for a plug, but um, I have a, a YouTube series called Soft Stories, uh, which is a set of readings done in a soft-spoken ASMR-style voice by myself, um, doing sort of classic or old literature. I've done things from... Um, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, Stoic Philosophy, to uh, Emma by Jane Austen and uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by um, Jules Verne. So a wide variety of stuff, but all um, more antique lit, done some Sherlock Holmes stuff and, and things like that. Um, but if you're interested in hearing more of my uh, dulcet tones, and I'm interested in the opportunity to experience some of these older books uh, and maybe fall asleep while doing so. Uh, I'd love for you to check it out. It's currently on hiatus at the moment while I retool some things behind the scenes, but I look forward to getting back to it soon. Again, where can, where can we find you? Sure, uh, that's uh, Soft Stories at YouTube. Uh, so youtube.com slash soft stories will get you there. Great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and Google that real quick uh, just so that way I can link it. And then um, do you have any other projects going on or anything else that you want to talk about or anything else uh, that you want to plug? Because you did come on my show. You gave me that, that you know, that, that guest spot. So you might as well pimp yourself out of while you can, man. Yeah, I, I'm not really in the public sphere. I have a, a Twitter at Stratonimbus, S-T-R-A-T-T-O-N-I-M-B-U-S. Um but I don't really post on there. I'm super inactive on Twitter. So you can follow me if you want to receive <laughs> uh, updates on Oni Girl every, <laughs> every week, because <laughs> I'm far more engaged with, uh, with what Lindsay's doing in the public sphere. Um, but most of my time outside, or, or my outside projects are D&D uh, &D based. So I run a, a couple of D&D &D games for some friends of mine that have spiraled out into other worlds of hobbies including crafting and music curation and things like that so it's a a good time but um one of the reasons i am not as up into video games is because tabletop is is consuming everything you know what if you would have told me that you were more into dungeons and dragons i would have totally let all of that slide i <laughs> i am I, a buddy of mine he plays because uh, he's a teacher in in the local area with his wife I ran a campaign for them and then they branched off and they did their own thing because life got real for them. You know, they, they got married, they bought a house, they did all this other great stuff and they're now in a campaign in D&D &D, and I'm I'm jealous. I am legitimately jealous. Like I I love D&D &D so much. Like I love playing it. I love being the DM. I don't care what capacity it is. I just want to be there. Um, I know I'm a challenge for DMs because I like to do a lot of weird stuff, but hey, what, what you know, what can you do? So um, yeah, I just all that all that judgment about the gaming. I'm letting all that slide now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh man, sure. I, I wasn't feeling any judgment <laughs> until this moment. <laughs> There's a lot of judgment that's like, hey, you call yourself a gamer, but it's like, no, no, because you D and D. No, that's fair. That's tabletop where you actually interact, where it takes other people to interact with, is is far superior than video gaming any day. Um, so a little bit of news about me real quick. Uh, I did uh, appear on a podcast called Mementos, uh, where I talked about my parrots and a giant parrot feather I have. So go check that out. Uh, please check out Stratton. He's, he's got a lot of great stuff. If you really like his voice, I know that I'm probably going to listen to some of your stuff tonight, uh, for sure. Um, I, I always need a little bit of background noise when I fall asleep. And so instead of listening to, to catch a predator, it might be nice to listen to an actual story instead. <laughs> yeah, I know Chris Hans. I'm, it's we. I have this weird fascination with Chris Hansen. I don't know. It's just, he's, he's, he's he also has a great voice that is very easy to listen to. So, yeah. uh, it, it's it's weird that it's jumbled up with all that other stuff, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's like, Chris Hansen, you're a cool dude. So We need a Chris Hansen supercut of yeah. just him <laughs> speaking to himself for the course of uh, however long. Just him answering about, asking you a bunch of questions that there are no answers to. That'd be great. All right. Well, Stratton, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry I ate up like an extra hour of your time. I appreciate it. Tell Lindsay my best. 
go check out Oni Girl. It's a fantastic comic. I've been burning and turning through it. I absolutely love the way that the story's going. I'm not going to spoil it for anybody because now people are real big on spoilers. So Stratton, it's been an absolute pleasure. Would you uh, would you be apt to doing this again with maybe you and Lindsay, or just you by yourself? Or absolutely, I I have uh, really enjoyed this time we've had together. I know that it has gone on longer than we anticipated, but um, <laughs> the fact that I haven't really noticed the time going by is a great indicator for how much of a good time I've been having. So Jared, thank you very much. I know that Lindsay enjoyed her episode as well, so I think we would. I'd love to come back in whatever capacity you have time for us. Well, you've got the link for my calendar. I am free and clear for the foreseeable future pending this date that is happening, if that goes well. Mm-hmm. Might be a little bit more strict at time, but, you know, if uh, if you and Lindsay both want to pop on, just go ahead and click the clock away. Let me know when and where, and I'd be more than happy to shoot you another link and have three people on for a podcast. You know, it's funny. That's what, that's what I said last time. My last podcast was like, you know, I've never had three people on a podcast. I should do that sometime. So if you guys want to... Hop on in then and, and knock it out of the park. Let's rock and roll. But otherwise, thank you again, Stratton. Absolutely. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. See all you beautiful bastards later. I'm going to go to sleep now. Good night. <laughs>
say so I have to pack my things and go Get the blowjack and don't you pick No, no 